how can blockchain gaming enhance the esports experience? Hello everyone, hope you hear, hear me well. Very happy to be here. I'm Flavien de Frère, uh, head of community of Block Blockchain Game Alliance. The Blockchain Game Alliance is a non-profit organization committed to promoting blockchain within the gaming industry. Uh, our goal is really to spread awareness about blockchain technologies and uh, we want to encourage adoptions by highlighting new ways to foster new ideas, uh, to build, to create, to build communities, to play uh, around games. So uh, we really want to offer this open forum for every individual companies involved in blockchain and involved in the gaming industry to work together, collaborate together, help them collaborate with the, the, the right people. And that's why we are here today, actually, because we're very happy to have uh, 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 450 companies in the BGA right now all over the world. And one of the things we really like to do is to provide this panel with BGA members as we have uh, today. And the question will be obviously based on eSports, uh, which is the chapter <laughs> of this uh, section. Uh, so very happy to be here. Obviously, uh, I will have the opportunity to have uh, two members uh, with me to talk about uh, esports and blockchain gaming. So, guys, first I would like to ask you to introduce yourself. Uh, come from you, Antonio. And thank you, Flav, for this opportunity. I am Antonio Ramicello. I'm the CEO and founder of Incantum Games, and we are developing Crown Chaser. Uh, my background is from Google. I worked with Google for my past four years. Uh, as advent, ads inventory and since 2017 I've been involved in crypto starting with trading then arbitrage and now um, just in one year we switched to web3 gaming yeah, thank you uh, my name is Mariano Rubinstein and co-founder and CEO of Sura gaming it's a web3 gaming guild the largest in the Hispanic market uh, I don't have a background in crypto or gaming, but from two years to now, it became my passion to create uh, esports and uh, managing a community, a large community of gamers. Uh, one of the biggest uh, community of scholars in South America, so that's quite impressive. And uh, so. With the gaming industry growing so much, uh, expecting to grow to over $300 million in the next uh, few years, eSports will be a big part of it, obviously, but we kind of noticed that the eSports, um, will say, ecosystem is hard, and for eSports team especially to, uh, to make money, uh, not only based on sponsorship. So the idea is to have a conversation about how to leverage blockchain in the esports ecosystem. So I guess as uh, a first question will be obviously to have your opinion, maybe your definition of what is an esports experience. Right, so I first, I think that when we are speaking about esports, we have to speak uh, about competitiveness, right? Uh, because actually the esports is about being the best of the best in that category. And usually those categories are, are the games. Um, the experience it involves different stakeholders. For example, uh, you have the pro player, you have the uh, the team that support the pro players. You have actually um, you have the fans that, in other way, support the um, the players. So it's an entire ecosystem that it's it's coming alive thanks to the esports. And something that I'm really excited about esports is, for example, if we speak about football never a chance for myself to play with Cristiano Ronaldo, right? But in the eSports, uh, I mean, uh, I can play, most of the uh, pro players, they play and engage with the community by having like playing session with them. So uh, they, um, there is this very uh, nice feeling and nice relationship that uh, pro players can build together with their, uh, um, their fans, actually. Mariano, obviously, as a guild, you are involved in a lot of um, activation in the uh, esports ecosystem, but we will talk about that. But do you share the same definition then? And I believe that the Web3 gaming started without the esports side, and it, it, it was developed uh, step by step. 
nowadays we're seeing like a fusion or a merge of Web 2 eSport with Web 3. Uh, we are, for example, last week we created a tournament, an Axie Infinity tournament uh, with a prize pool of $40,000 in Argentina. And th there was a huge event uh, on site, many people uh, challenging the players. And so I believe that Web 2 eSports and Web 3 games are merging and uh, they are creating a new kind of Web3 sports, uh, very competitiveness. Um, Antonio, so your team with Conchaser, you're developing a game. Obviously, we could talk a lot about that for sure, but related to eSports, are you already thinking of a way for the game to be enjoyable in an eSports level? Of course, uh, our game has a very uh, deep component about esports. Uh, I think that there are some requirements for a um, game to go uh, competing in the sports in, uh, industry. One of them is the fairness, because unfortunately we have a lot of games that are not skillet based but are money based. So it means that the more someone pays or invests inside this game is more powerful than the others, right? And this is the against the value of the esports because esports is about fair competitiveness and it's about the skills, right? It's not about how much your wallet is. So about this, we are making a game that is fair. So it's like we have removed the pay to win out of the equation, which is something that players are asking for a long time and it's something that the blockchain and the Web3 industry uh, should solve as, as issue. Uh, another thing is about the tournaments, because of course you cannot have competi uh, the competition without tournaments. That's why we are having a series of tournaments, uh, switching from being the major one to the little one, where everybody has the uh, opportunity to join. Because uh, traditionally, in, the way, in traditional games, if someone wants to join an esport organization, he must be uh, scouted by people you know, that participate to events or like uh, see the leaderboards, whatever. Uh, in Web3 and especially in Crown Chaser, we are giving the, uh, the opportunity to everybody to make a, a stand in our own uh, ecosystem by allowing everyone, each of them, uh, of the players, of about um, joining the tournament itself. Interesting. So actually going to the guild side, uh, you mentioned that you uh, actually organize, and you are organizing a lot of uh, competition in the eSport level, uh, especially with Axie Infinity. And we know that one of the pain points for eSports nowadays is to manage so many IPs based on the game, publisher, and everything around with uh, advertisers as well. What could be your, what, what is, what was your experience uh, working with Axie Infinity for organizing these events? Well, uh, our experience, uh, it's quite different because at the beginning, the, the tournaments were only online and everyone has the same kind of composition, the same axis. Uh, then we detected uh, on our scholar base some players with special skills and special abilities, so we started to change their compositions to give them better teams to compete and to move them to different sectors within the company. Now we have a pro player team with uh, a head coach, a psychologist and many people, we are almost 30 people that uh, only works as pro players. So we took many things from our scholars. Very interesting, actually, because you're saying that you so big uh, opportunity for you as a guild is to capitalize on your scholars, obviously large amounts of scholars, um, and you're saying that based on what they are, how they are performing, you are able to track that and are able to uh, use it for an esport initiative. That's right. Yeah. We have created a set of uh, technology tools for recruiting the people to be uh, in our scholar base. So with that information and then matching that with the performance, 
on internal tournaments, we can select them and see which ones are fit for being uh, professional players, which ones are fit for content creators, and some others are great for marketing or any other job within our company. Okay, cool. Uh, and actually, I want to ask, ask you that question. Now, obviously, Antonio, if you want to jump in, I would love to. Um, obviously, we know for a fact that it's very hard uh, first to capitalize on games you can actually play and based on NFTs. It's a true fact. Um, but Axie Infinity, as an example, with the competition, do, do you feel the, the main part, with my experience uh, attending uh, these kind of tournaments, you feel the excitement of everyone looking at the score, looking at the players. Um, for Axie Infinity, how was it? Was it the same feeling? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the, the same fanatism like uh, League of Legends or any other Web2 game. The people, it's completely excited, shouting. Yeah, it's the same. Interesting. Perfect. Obviously, ownership of digital assets is a big part of uh, how we explain blockchain gaming, but it's, all, it's also a big part of how we could enhance the eSports experience, uh, how we could bring ownership of digital assets. So, no money put no manipulatable, no, no alterable to esports. Um, what do you think about that? Do you, how could ownership uh, be used in esports, according to you, Antonio? Well, uh, the main difference about the Web 2 games and the Web 3 games about ownership, it's about uh, most, if not any, of the intellectual property in the Web 2 belongs to the publisher slash game studio. While in the Web 3 you have this ecosystem that is already present in the web too, such content, crea content creators, esports, uh, trainings and things like that, that actually wasn't, was not uh, ac accessing to the, their piece of pie, right? Web3 can solve this issue by allowing the ownership of the asset, but not only about the NFTs, but even about the intellectual property, properties or having access to um, the earnings of the game. For example, beside the NFTs, we can have uh, a DAO that control the treasury of the game. And inside this uh, treasury, uh, essentially the game studio, such as, for example, part of our income will be, um, will be migrated to this treasury, which will be controlled and owned by the token holders. So they can start rotation about how to spend those uh, tokens inside the treasury. One use case can be like um, rewarding the people that has increased the ecosystem the most. For example, uh, there are a lot of content creators that they sponsor the games on, on Twitch, on YouTubers, and they are lacking of sponsorship from games. They have to, um, they, they are supported mostly by, from their fans or from their viewership, right? We can solve this issue by, for example, having them getting part of the treasury for their hard work and their commitment to increase the awareness of the entire game. The same thing can be applied for guilds or for esport organization, where a part of the treasury can be allocated to create offline or online events, where essentially um, the, the DAO, which is uh, working closely to the team, that in, in our case it's us, are going to uh, create. Got it, got it. So Education, obviously, it's a big part of Web3. Uh, we, I don't think I need to mention why. Uh, and you are, you, are pr you, you are doing a lot in terms of education, Anio Mariano, but not only uh, for Web3 gaming, but specifically for eSports as well. Can you talk about that? We are uh, very convinced that education is a fundamental part of Web3. Web3 today is very, very small. It's almost nothing compared to what it will be. And we have invested a lot of time in creating different programs. We created in 2022 a postgraduate study on gaming and metaverse uh, together with the University of Buenos Aires. And for 2023, we are launching four different uh, education programs. 
One, it will be a postgraduate study in Web3 and gaming, uh, together with the University of Buenos Aires and Paul Calot. Then we will have a short program uh, that it will be taught in all schools in the city of Buenos Aires with the support of the government from, uh, for, from 16 years uh, and up. And two specific programs, one uh, which is a Pro Player Academy in which we create and we help develop the necessary skills to be a professional player. So to be someone who plays as a job, uh, a full-time player. And the fourth one, it's a, content a Web3 content creation program in which we partnered with Paramount. They will add all the content and the artistic part. So we are putting a lot of effort in education because we believe that education is the base for Web3 in the future. Wonderful. Um, one last question just before, uh, if you do have questions yourself, uh, please, um, just after that question, it will be on something you know. And I think uh, the, 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 the panel before mentioned it, Sal Ban Token. I know that you have some opinion on it. Uh, obviously, in my mind, is to allow players to have a, a digital identity ba based on his capacity to be the best. Uh, but what's your take on that for Mariano and Antonio? I, let's start with the saying that Soulbound is something, if, if crypto, if Web3 gaming, it's, it's uh, something very new. Soulbound is born yesterday, you see. So we know still not much about it. We have just an idea of about what it will be, how would, how would it look like. And to be honest with you, from what I'm learning and reading and the very small use case that I've seen, I'm very against it. Because it reminds me about the social score system that they have in the USA, or like the, um, sorry, the final, final financial score that they have in the USA, or like the social score that they have like in places like China. And Salbound it's a could lead to the control, right? To and web and the blockchain itself is always about decentralization, right? So I think that at some point the salbound goes against some main value of the blockchain. Because actually who's going to issue those tokens? Who is going to control those tokens? You know? Um, if it is a company, for example, um, and I don't like this company and I, I speak publicly about this company, which I don't like. And what if this company wants to, um, to punish me, you know? And instead of saying, okay, this guy is trustable, uh, is likable, he's speaking bad about us, you know, on Twitter and things like that, so let's penalize him, you know? So the cell bound can be changed uh, and can be a bad reflection about the user behavior, you see? So from my point of view, from, for what we have now, we should think better about the use case of the salbound. Of course, this could be interesting for the gaming uh, industry, for the game industry, sorry, because for example, you can through legitimate the, um, the owner or give titles to a player. For example, if someone wins a major league, right, uh, you can give him a salbound token, which ex essentially say, okay, he's the real uh, winner of this given tournament, right? So uh, in this way, you can you can um, you can build trust around the ecosystem. But at some at same at the very same way, this could be used to be like privacy violation or something like that. So again, uh, the idea the idea could be it's here. There are people, there are companies that are, are al already developing something around the soulbound, but it's it's too early and it's very sensitive things, you know. Got it. Mariano, what yeah, do you think? I, I think very similar to Antonio. I believe that that could be a great idea. Uh, we should wait until someone can put it in, put it to work properly 
it can work on the health uh, industry, it can work on the education industry in which you can validate some titles, but I don't see it right now as a full uh, person within the solvent. Thank you very much, you too. I don't know if you have any question in the audience, feel free to ask. Okay, one, two, three. Okay, thank you very much, everyone.